uh, a native, native of Brooklyn, New York, uh, William Bennett went to high school here in the district at Gonzaga, famed high school. Uh, he studied philosophy at Williams College and took a PhD at the University of Texas in Austin in political philosophy and earned a law degree from Harvard. He has had a multifaceted career centered mostly on education. He was an award-winning teacher at Boston University, at UT, and at Harvard. And three times he has been a confirmed executive in the Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush administrations, including holding two cabinet-level positions. Uh, he was chairman of the National Endowment of Humanities for Ronald Reagan before he appointed him Secretary of Education. And he was the nation's first drug czar under George Bush the Elder. He's also been very successful in the private sector. Uh, he was the co-founder of K-12, an online education company. Worked with Project Lead the Way, a leading provider of training curriculum in American schools. Uh, and uh, he's an, on, uh, uh, an advisor for Udacity.com, an online higher education company based in California. And another one called Beanstalk Innovation, an international education company. Uh, but you probably are very familiar with his writings from the Book of Virtues to his justly praised three-volume set on the history of the United States uh, called last, The Last Best Hope. Um, he is the author of 24 more, more than 24 books, including two of which were New York Times number one bestsellers. Uh, he is currently the host of the number seven ranked nationally syndicated radio show, Morning in America. Please join me in welcoming uh, former Secretary of Education, Dr. William J. Bennett. Thank you, Matthew. Ladies and gentlemen, sounds like more like an obituary every year, doesn't it? <laughs> I guess that's I guess that's right. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Uh, following these two uh, important men and leaders of Hillsdale is a great pleasure and honor. These, by the way, are the golden days of Hillsdale. It has never been better. It has never been better led, and you should be very proud to be associated with it. I know something of Hillsdale, something of the history. I won't do a Ronald Reagan joke. Oh, 1844, yes, I remember that, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I've, uh, I've known about it for a while, and these are indeed the golden days. Well done, well led. Nicely done, guys. Um, I'm going to be brief for at least not as long as it may seem uh, to some of you, and then uh, we'll do some Q&A, whatever you want to talk about. I'm going to talk about the Constitution in a somewhat different way. Uh, a couple of examples of where we're falling short, I think, and uh, the Constitution as part of the culture and why the culture is uh, hurting the cause of the Constitution. Um, I'm not going to respond to John Yu. Um, that's a heck of an act to follow, I'll tell you. Uh, did you all, did anybody make reference to John Yu on the John Stewart show? Did anybody ever see that? <coughs> John Yu was on the John Stewart show. Yeah, that John Stewart. And John Stewart decided to take him on. Foolish man. <laughs> and the next day, John Stewart said, and this is available on YouTube, he said, I got my lunch handed to me last night <coughs> by, uh, by John Yu. It was devastating. It was brilliant, and it was all perfectly deserved. A um, couple things about the Constitution you may or may not know. Some of this you will know, some of this you may not. Did you know that our Constitution is the most imitated political document in the world? That's pretty good. Even regimes that are not legitimate cite and quote our Constitution to appear legitimate. It is the mark, it is the currency of political legitimacy. Uh, we have lived longer Though we are a young country, we have lived longer continuously under a single document than any people in the world, despite the fact that we are a young country. There's a joke, a story about the uh, man who goes into the British Museum, which is, of course, the library in London, and asks for a copy of the French Constitution. I'm sorry, sir, says the clerk, we don't keep periodicals here. <laughs> 
This one has lasted. The American Revolution has lasted as well because it is one of the few in history that has not betrayed the hopes of its children. It continues to offer those hopes and that solace. What is constitution or what is constitutionalism? Someone said once, I love, that, I love this, it's the hope and belief that words on parchment can keep men to their duties and responsibilities. Think about that. It really is what it is, isn't it? The notion that those words can keep us to our responsibilities. Yeah, we can talk and maybe we have to go to war, maybe we have to go to court, but those words will somehow guide us and bind us. Why is the Constitution suffering today? First of all, in some quarters of our country, more and more people are turning to it, adhering to it, carrying it around, referring to it, saying, let's go back to it. Many others are ignoring it. I'll talk about one of those guys in a minute. One of the reasons for this, I believe, in a phrase, is the pollution of time. Things old are now considered bad because they are old. Things new are considered good only because they are new. I used to uh, teach in classrooms when I became Secretary of Education of the United States. My wife said, why don't you go into classrooms around the country and talk to kids and then make your pronouncements about education? She said, why don't you do your homework first? I said, why should I be different from the other guys in Washington? She said, because you are the Secretary of Education, do your homework. I said, Lane, I am the Secretary of Education. I don't do retail, I do wholesale. And she, the daughter of a successful businessman, said, do good retail and you'll do better wholesale. <laughs> so I went to the Emma Conn Elementary School in Raleigh, North Carolina, taught the third grade. And I asked them whether it was a good thing or a bad thing to grow old. And they were all convinced it was a bad thing to grow old. Why? Because you get cranky and rickety and you forget things and you step on your glasses. And... <laughs> yeah, there's some truth to that. Um, so I said, well, let me tell you a story about a guy who was getting old, a guy named George Washington. And I told the story, you know it well, famous story about how Washington was trying to stop his troops from marching, marching on Washington after the war. They hadn't been paid and they wanted to get paid. They were ready to come down and hold Congress at uh, Bayonet Point. Maybe not the worst idea in the history of, uh, all due respect, Tom, for some of your colleagues, you know. And Washington uh, was making his arguments. He wasn't particularly eloquent. And he remembered something someone had written down. He'd put it in his pocket and he pulled it out. When he pulled it out, he put on his spectacles and he heard a gasp from his men because they had never seen him in eyeglasses before. And he said, ah, I see you're surprised to see that I wear spectacles. He said, well, I have become not only gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. That simple eloquence reminded them of who he was, who they were, what they were engaged in, and so they abandoned their plan. I said, now, part of his convincing kids was because he was old, getting older. It wasn't it. And they said, yeah, well, maybe, maybe not all bad. It's a philosopher's trick. I'm a teacher of philosophy. It's the distinction between the natural good and the moral good. You might get older and more rickety and clumsy and fall down a few times, but you can still get better in a moral sense. It may have nothing to do with how you are as a natural creature, but as a moral creature, things can get better. But that's not where the emphasis is on the culture. The culture today emphasizes the new and the young and the innovative. In education, a field I know pretty well, about 30 years ago, innovative became a synonym for good. Traditional became a synonym for bad. It's also suffering, the cause of constitutionalism, because our culture's disbelief in limiting principles and clear and objective truths. Our president has abused these constitutional powers at almost every turn from delaying and changing the implementation of Obamacare in how many different ways, 
to enacting immigration reforms by executive fiat, but pulling short of enacting the ones we thought he was going to do this time, to making unconstitutional recess appointments to the NLRB. There are a lot of examples. The one I cite all the time is it just rings so untrue to what our founders were talking about. Was Congress passing a law to insulate themselves from the costs of Obamacare, to get a subvention from the government agencies so they could cover all their costs, even if they were increased dramatically in a way that the American people would not be covered. James Madison wrote in Federalist 57, they will make no law, the legislature, which will not have its full operation upon themselves and their friends, as well as on the great mass of the society. That's a great betrayal, what they did there, and it's not the only one. The public's ignorance of the Constitution allows for this, and the public's indifference to it allows for it. And the public's disappointment and cynicism about disappointment in and cynicism about politics also contributes to this disregard of the Constitution. But the public's not aware of a lot of things. And when Larry talks about crisis, the crisis that most concerns me is the crisis of understanding, the crisis of failure to grasp, to understand what this country is and what it is about can be illustrated in lots of ways. It was illustrated in 2012 in a Pew Research poll reporting that 49% of people aged 18 to 29, 49% of people aged 18 to 29 say they have a positive view of socialism. 43% say they have a negative view. The Pew poll found that 46% of people aged 18 to 29 have a positive view of capitalism, 40% of negative views. For the 18 to 29 year olds, socialism is better than capitalism. What the hell have we been doing? What in God's name have we been teaching? Let's go back to college. Let's go back to Hillsdale. Let's go back to the high schools. Let's get this thing right. You want regard for the Constitution? Let's get the history right. In 1987, Yesterday, 1987, I was in um, <clears throat> September 17th, 1987, I was in uh, Nicaragua, in Managua. I was asked to give a speech. I was Ronald Reagan's Secretary of Education. I was asked to give a speech about our Constitution. And of course, the war was raging between the Contras and the Sandinistas. Uh, I gave the speech. Afterwards, I was congratulated on the speech by some of the Contra people and the mothers, uh, and then a group came up, black robes, and it was my old teachers, or at least the same order, Jesuits. My friend Dr. Ryan will know what we're talking about here. They said, pretty good, you're pretty good. These were left-wing Jesuits. Is that redundant? Uh, <laughs> saying, yeah, you, you've, you've, got, you've got some, you, you can, we taught you how to speak, but you have the message wrong. I said, no, I don't think so, and I talked about freedom and talked about uh, the hopes of freedom of, for those people. I'll never forget that, uh, I'll never forget that trip. The plane stopped in Tegucigalpa, we got some more gas, we landed in, the, in uh, Managua. The plane slowed down, I don't think it ever really fully stopped, and we were told to get out. Uh, we looked to our left and there were Cuban soldiers, there were Russian planes. I thought, man, they're close. Um, and it was a great opportunity to give that speech. That night I stayed at the American Embassy, called my wife. She said, what's that in the background? I said, fireworks, <laughs> fireworks. It was fire, but it wasn't fireworks. Anyway, the regard we have for the Constitution is sacred, but it is underappreciated, that document, because of the reasons I have just cited. The country has never needed it more because the country has never needed guardrails more. Let me tell you what I think is going on by borrowing from one of my favorite authors. I know favorite author of many of you too, 
and that's C.S. Lewis. And I'll conclude my remarks with some of his thoughts. Why don't people pay more attention to the Constitution? Well, Lewis would put it this way, at least I think he would approve of putting it this way. This is uh, the great book, Screwtape Letters. This is the advice of one devil to another. You remember this. This is Uncle Screwtape to Nephew Wormwood. He writes, we must encourage in them the horror of the same old thing. The horror of the same old thing is one of the most valuable passions we have produced in the human heart. It is an endless source for us of, of catching souls. It is a source of heresy and religion, folly and counsel, infidelity and in marriage, and inconstancy and in friendship. Humans live in time, and they experience reality successively. To experience much of it, therefore, they must experience many different things. In other words, they must experience change. And since they need change, the enemy, it's of course God, has made change pleasurable to them. But since he does not wish them to make change any more than eating an end in itself, he has balanced the love and change in them by a love of permanence as well. We must destroy that love of permanence and replace it instead with only a love of change. Of a proposed course of action, he, the enemy, wants men, so far as I can see, to ask very simple questions. Is it right? Is it prudent? Is it possible? But if we can keep men from asking those questions and ask instead, is it in accordance with the general movement of our time? Is it progressive? Is it reactionary? Will I be a contemporary? Will I be well regarded in my neighborhood? Is this the way that history is going? Then they will neglect the relevant questions. Again, what are those relevant questions? Is it right? Is it righteous? Is it prudent? Is it possible? All change is good, according to Screw Tape. All permanence is bad. We need the Constitution because we need that permanence. We need that Constitution because we need those guardrails. But almost the entire culture is in war, at war against the permanent. It likes the new. It doesn't like the old. It likes the innovative. It doesn't like the traditional. The innovative can be good, but it's a separate category of analysis. It isn't good simply because it's new simply because it is the iPhone 6 or plus doesn't make it good. That just makes it new. But if you want to produce a frenzy, do not produce a constitution unless maybe there's a constitution 6 plus produce a new piece of technology. If we are to be kept from merely pursuing the frenzy and pursuing the ephemeral, we need to have regard for the time that it takes to do good and important work. The kind of work that is done patiently and thoughtfully over the years at a Hillsdale College, the time and work that is taken in a home by a family with its children, the time and the work that ought to be taken in a school in those years from K to 12, which have become such a wasteland in so many places, demonstrable by so many facts. Because we live in a world in which people are not sure there is something called truth, how can they have repair to the truth of our polity, the truth of our republic, which is our constitution? The problem lies in us, the crisis, to use Larry's word, lies in us, the crisis lies in the culture. And I believe that's where the solution lies too. So let's enter the culture at all those places. Let's talk, as he says, let's teach. Let's remember what we learned and teach them to the next generation. Wordsworth says what we have loved, others will love, but we must teach them how. 
They don't know this when they're born. We have to teach them. That's our work. Thank you very much. I welcome your questions.